Okay, panelists for panel one, please take your seats. Up at the front. Darren, Kevin, Paul, Chuck, and Jennifer. And I'm going to have them introduce themselves each individually, and then I'm going to dive into a quick overview and then we'll get into the meat and potatoes. So we'll start right here on the end of the gentleman in the purple shirt. Tell us who you are and why you're here. Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Kevin Javars. I'm a Saint of Holmes and a fellow of Colorado. I'm here with my associate with Vincent and Paul. And uh, we're excited to be here and part of something that uh, our company is quite passionate about. And uh, we will have some good insights to share with them. Uh, uh, we may offer some uh, ideas and solutions towards the end of the law here. So we're going to Fantastic. Chuck. My name is Chuck Murphy. I'm uh, uh, born and raised in Florida Springs 81 years ago. <laughs> Holy yeah. back. I guess he's getting the age award today. <laughs> Way to go, Chuck. Anyway, um, I've been involved in the housing and, and building industry for a long, long time. And I uh, very much like to see some changes being made so that. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you being here. Darren? Hi, uh, Darren Saruba. I'm the president and uh, founder of Eco Cabins. Uh, we pride ourselves on being simple, smart, sustainable housing. It's all about factory built uh, housing. It's uh, built in a factory, delivered on site, 100% finished. And then it's part of it. We built the three different codes, two codes really, if you look at it temporary and permanent housing. And we're also the founders of the Tiny House Jamboree, uh, which the second year this year we have about 50,000 people show up. Uh oh, I've been saying 65, I guess. I'm gonna have to up. Uh, uh, yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Uh, Paul? Uh, Hi, my name is Paul Spotts. I work at the, in the Center of Legal People with Disabilities. I provide home modifications and assistance to Tom. Fantastic. And Jennifer? My name is Jennifer Roberts. I'm a volunteer with HAP, and if it wasn't for family, I would be one of the homeless that we were talking about. Master's degree, worked hard, IRA, the whole route. It's not something that gets just somebody who um, has a right to the law or has had drugs. It can be anybody at a given moment. Very good. Thank you, Jennifer. A lot of people here probably know me. I'm in uh, Colorado Springs, uh, born and raised in the 60s, but came back here in 94 with my wife and, of course, and my firstborn, and I've been back here since 94. Uh, I've been involved in startup companies for about 30 years. I've done about 15 of them around the world, uh, and for the last eight years, I've been kind of spending more of my time here locally, uh, kind of chairing the Colorado Springs Entrepreneurs Group, where we work with a lot of seed stage and startup and development entrepreneurs, men and women, veterans, it's been an absolute joy in the last eight years to really reach out and communicate and work with a number of these innovative entrepreneurs here in town. So what we're going to do, uh, I'm going to dive into a quick overview about this whole innovative and affordable housing development area. Now there's a lot of uh, permutations and aspects to this, so uh, we're going to have to do this quick in about 45 minutes. Uh, all right, so here's the focus areas we're going to spend uh, time on today. Uh, obviously our tax incentives for traditional home builders enough. We've seen a lot of these interesting innovative tax credits out there. Are they working? We'll dive in a little bit about that. What forms of public-private partnerships need to be created that are not created now that could potentially change this model? Uh, are manufactured housing addressing affordable housing needs? And we know that manufactured housing has had difficulties in financing, but again, the problem has been... Yes? That's I'm sorry. <laughs> Did I get my I'm sorry. Looks like it got mixed up. It's actually panel one, but the number says two. Oh, so okay. thank you very for catching it, Jennifer. Because everybody's like, wait a minute, it's on panel two. <laughs> uh, and then our tiny house solutions, or tiny houses solution to low cost affordable housing. Do tiny houses on wheels have a role to play? Do tiny house communities or villages, trailer and foundation based have a role? And what should be developed for homeless housing? How does emergency? Transitional and long term sustainable housing get built. And I got to tell you, these three buckets of housing is one of the things that caught my attention when I first started talking with Rocky Mountain Health and Human Services. When I started sitting in on the CADCH meeting, 
about homeless veterans and started recognizing, yes, we have homeless shelters. Yes, we have long-term traditional uh, sustainable housing that's su subsidized by state and federal governments. But the issue is we've got this ginormous gap at the emergency and transitional housing area. And it's not been addressed effectively because a lot of the tools and methods in the traditional home building community has not been able to reach down. Some of the, the statistics that I've heard in the past have been most developers cannot build a house below $200,000 and make money. Now again, I might ask Chuck that question. Is that really the case? Does it cost upwards of $200,000 to make a quality home today? Can you make money at that amount? I'm not sure that you can. Gotcha. And, and you know, that's a, a, a pretty straightforward answer because not only is it land costs, it's, right? Sure. All the development fees, the land costs, the construction costs, the development, it's um, very difficult. And this is one of the things I started looking at in my research in the last couple of years. Again, I'm not a housing professional. I'm a business development and technology guy. And I've done satellite internet and hit broadband data broadcasting and computers and software. And I looked at the housing industry and I said, wait a minute, there's a lot of interesting parts and pieces here that we can basically start deconstructing and putting together. Remember, we're thinking outside the box now. And again, looking at this panel, not only manufactured housing, traditional housing, tiny houses, as well as homeless, let's start diving down and start looking at some of these areas where we may be able to start moving some chess pieces around, whether it's in zoning, whether it's in ordinances, whether it's in building codes. And, and I've been getting a really good education on this from Darren Zaruba, because he spent the last, what, Darren, 20 years in doing building and development? And Darren has jumped in, full tilt bozo, into this space in tiny houses. In the last three or four years, he's, he's cut a rug in terms of trying to deconstruct zoning, building codes, and he's making some very good progress. One of the questions I have for you, Darren, is, what do you feel has been achieved to date in terms of zoning or zoning and coding? And what do you think needs to happen going forward in order for not only small form factor or small square footage housing to be built, but even tiny houses in its new form? Yeah, that's, a, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, tiny, tiny houses are their own animal because it's a house basically built on a trailer and they're 95% of the builders in the U.S. right now really don't build to a code, so that even uh, the, the, it's still titled as a trailer, so that makes it even more difficult. But uh, one of the things that we've seen, uh, at least in the 2016 International Residential Code for Factory Built, is that uh, they've eliminated the uh, minimum square footage. And this is one of the things you'll learn in the next panel on zoning and planning with David Walsenberg, David Walsenberg, to get that square footage down. But we'll we'll let, let them talk about that in the next section. But one of the areas of, of homeless and homeless housing is this area of emergency housing. And I know, Jennifer, you spent some time looking at this as a volunteer at PATH. And what you've learned at PATH is basically that we, we have such a large number of homeless in this community. What would you say the percentages of them need immediate emergency housing versus transition versus long-term sustainable? This was a, really the area of transit, transit. Right. And the key is, is that really the, the whole idea of supportable or housing first models that have been the, been the mantra is you've got to get people housed first before you can start doing all the rest of the supportive services. And, uh, and uh, basically, Paul, you basically are looking at this model for assistive technology. You don't see a lot of housing being built for handicaps that address the needs for the handicapped community. Out of the homeless population, how many people do you think fall into that category? They hope the actual handicap category that we need assistive technology for housing. What are you talking about? Physical or mental? Physical, Physical. initially. Because mental is their own Absolutely. Um, well, the problem is when you start So, even with our veterans, you know, being a portion of it, you can run it 
Paul, in your experience as an assistive technology specialist at the Independent Center, have you reached out and spoke with builders and developers about the need for applying assistive technologies and building codes in homes? Um, it's, it's a work in progress. Um, how can developers would automatically, you know, make it, make it a little more accessible prior to building and prior to selling the house? Um, it would cut down on the home modification. We might have to move the mics around because there are people in the back that have a hard time hearing it. So kind of sliding back and forth. Uh, basically, Kevin, on your side, from the manufactured housing uh, side of the equation, are you seeing a lot of need for assistive technology and handicap in the builds for manufactured housing? We really do. Um, you know, we see a fair percentage of the people that work uh, serving that uh, require some degree of handicap access, fortunately. Um, our factories are in a position, in uh, the most part, to be able to live on on that basis. But uh, you know, I would like to see it become a little bit more standardized to help with accessibility because I think it's going to become more and more this time of life. Yeah. Have you seen a lot of uh, interest in accessory dwelling units for people that want to take a manufactured housing product and put it on an existing property for like a uh, you know granny cottage or a second second family unit? Indeed, generational suites are, are something that has been uh, uh, a commitment to Clayton Homes. Um, we want to make sure that as the uh, population ages, that we have the availability to keep people with families, the most of them, in a uh, supportive environment that still maintains their independence and dignity, but it still provides the safety and accessibility features uh, that people are going to require at uh, challenging times in their life. Now, that's a major commitment. Well, I'll kind of open this up to the whole panel. Is do you feel that the zoning and coding and ordinances for local municipalities have had some challenges to being able to build accessory dwelling units? Derek? Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially as it relates to tiny houses, too, because it's really an RV that somebody wants to live in full time as an accessory dwelling unit. But if you look at places, like uh, we work in uh, Texas and in Austin in particular, you know, places like Austin where the population has just you know, gone off the charts, they're very open to uh, ADUs above uh, garages and in, in backyards, and that just hasn't hit Colorado Springs yet. They don't see it, they, they don't feel the pain enough yet to make the change. Well, then, and this is one of the areas that we started looking at in our research was, you know, what is the impediment in a local community in terms of the barriers of getting these types of small form factor, low cost housing on an existing piece of property. I've had a lot of discussion with Todd uh, Lemming about this, about the fact that you have to change some of the offsets on a piece of property. But there's been absolutely, we've got about a 50 to 60 to 70 year old set of codes, and some of them date back hundreds of years in the United States that have limited the number of structures that you can put on your own existing private property, the size, the offsets. And more importantly, the requirement that you have to put utilities to that separate facility, that you could not extend it from your existing house to the new ADU, you have basically had to bring a completely new set of utilities. And this is a problem called tap fees. Chuck, in your career in building houses, was tap fees your biggest barrier in doing single family developments for utilities? Well, the tap fees are huge. They keep growing and growing and growing. You know, I, I think you know, if we separate it from Profit and those that are, are, are not the not the profit. Uh, the non uh, if you're building something that is for the nonprofit to succeed, then you know, they should waive the tax. So that's not easy to do all the time. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it requires leadership. And today, I think in Colorado Springs and El Paso County, we have that leadership, which we have had, we haven't had before. I remember years gone by. Chuck, did you ever run for mayor? <laughs> I'll be married 60 years. There you go. <laughs> you're already, yeah, you're tasked. <laughs> I ran for public office. I was on many committees for six years, and that was an interesting experience. But I really think that it's right, you know, for the those for the nonprofit. And I think there's an opportunity uh, to do a lot of things. have a person, we have a 
rent to flock pocket neighborhoods or clusters. But what we see is the big 800 pound gorilla in the room has been utilities. Chuck mentioned it earlier about the fact that these tap fees going into communities, the cost of gas, and water, and electric, and waste. Well, you know what? If you can build a microgrid, and a lot of people have been talking about sustainable energy concepts, this might be a way where we can actually bring them together into a cluster and actually create a grid with you know, fuel cell technologies and so forth to tie them all together. So the idea here is, and I, I want to pop ahead to one example um, and talk a little bit about the accessory dwelling units because this is the first baby step that a, a community can take. It may not go right away to allowing tiny houses on wheels due to zoning and ordinance. It's going to take time. It took David Rush from Walsenburg two years to get his code into place and passed with his city council to get his tiny house community started. So we know that we've got to take some gradual steps. So we know that we can go to the city and potentially say, well, let's do some innovations in ADUs. Now, some of you uh, have an ADU worksheet on your table. Is that correct, uh, Cindy? If you take a look at that ADU sheet uh, called accessory dwelling units, you get an idea of some of the challenges that we're faced with in Colorado Springs, if someone that's it right there. The ones that you want to basically put a house, a small house, a tiny house, or a small micro house on your property, whether you do it on a foundation or whether you do it uh, on a tiny house on wheels, on a trailer. And what we're advocating is that we think that the zoning and ordinances just for piloting. Now, this is a demonstration. This is the kind of things that we were talking about at the Jamboree. Darren, how many pilots are going on across the country today with people trying to get tiny houses on wheels in their communities? And I'll give you a hint. The first one that we know of is Ojai in California that's now allowing tiny houses on wheels. Yeah, the, the, the wheels is the, that's kind of the silver bullet right now. Everybody's right. trying to figure that out because everybody can do a tiny house on the foundation as an ADU if it's allowed in the zoning. But it's the whole tiny house on wheels and then are they built to a code and all that. So Ohio, California um, actually passed some ordinances for it. Walsenburg uh, passed some ordinances on reducing the minimum square footage. But really, there's a, there's a huge movement out there right now, a grassroots movement in the tiny house movement for people going and, and working with planning and zoning on and getting them as ADUs or creating clusters, small cluster communities of four of them to you know, 25 or 50 of them. It's a, it's a big, big thing right now. And again, looking at this accessory dwelling unit, uh, actually we had some uh, rules and regulations in Colorado Springs passed. I don't know how, how long ago it was, but there are very specific rules about how much, you know, space or what size of a building you can put on your property. And, you know, a fixed foundation ADU would dramatically expand the number of housing units available in the city if we just tweak these codes and these ordinances just a little bit. And, and even in that respect, maybe not permanently, let's try piloting. Let's try some commercial demonstrations. I've had some very interesting conversations uh, with another city located very nearby Colorado Springs. I won't mention it right now because I'm not sure if they want me to say this. Uh, but I've been, bet, been sitting in on a number of housing task force meetings with them, and it seems like the idea of a pilot project to test out some of these ideas is starting to grab hold. Because obviously, if we don't start trying and trialing some of these ideas, we're never going to get off the center line. So again, something like this with ADUs is almost a first step that we can take to make this happen. And part of this is, you know, some of them have been called granny cottages or medical cottages, and I can see assistive technologies and people with mental health issues, or even you know, adults that need assistance to speak, uh, or need assistance in their living, could essentially have a, an ADU properly built on their property and connected to their primary house. And, and again, with this concept that I showed you earlier of an above ground boardwalk. So this is a way to get the utilities from your house to the ADU without going through brain surgery with the utilities. Because again, if we can extend from the house with industry standard codes and concepts, we can rapidly get accessory dwelling units and houses built this way. And this is a concept that we've been looking at because it's a fast track way to build micro grids or micro communities to bring these tiny houses or micro houses together. So this is an area that I thought really was, was definitely worth ex expanding on uh, uh, and basically looking at it from the, the 
manufactured housing area, Kevin, do you think that the ADU space would grow dramatically if you had pre-done kits that you could basically bring to a, a property and interconnect the utilities from the ADU to the house? Well, absolutely. I mean, our expertise uh, is in building the homes, but that's only the first step. There's a lot more that obviously has to be made available uh, with regard to how we're going to get them installed. Uh, this is a company that, that hasn't forgotten its roots. It was founded by a share crop 60 years ago, and uh, now it's a Berkshire Hathaway company with a commitment uh, to this type of affordable housing and uh, accessibility. But we are only one small piece of the entire spectrum as far as, you know, we can deliver the houses at a modest cost, less than $40 a square foot in some cases, but there's still a lot of uh, other components beyond just the manufacturing of a home that have to be considered. Chuck, you have a follow-up? Yeah. Um, well, uh, Mike, you for 35 years, we owned and operated driving on this and uh, we had over 300 sites, and uh, um, so it was a large facility, and we had one water tap and one sewer tap. Um, and so, I mean, if you can find, especially if you're with the nonprofit sector, if you can find reasons I put on here was electricity, heat, water, and bio waste. Because one of the biggest costs that home developers have is bringing waste pipes and waste services out to the property and then being able to distribute it all the houses. Well, if we had a way of actually doing and managing bio waste incineration, we don't have a need for that waste pipe. Sometimes it's anywhere between, you know, a half a million dollars to bring in waste services into a large development. And again, if you do a pocket neighborhood with only 10 or 20 houses, and you solve the human waste product by incinerating it and turning it into ash or turning it into a sin gas, I can reuse it. So the, this idea of being able to look at innovative, and this has got to be a discussion that we've got to push and have with utilities, with Colorado Springs Utilities. Are you willing to test and try some unique distributed power generation, distributed waste management? A lot of these areas, there's a ton of technology out there, but, but like you said, uh, it was basically that there's not, you, you know, you can focus on being a home builder, but you're not a technology provider, right? Uh, okay. So, I mean, the, the idea there is that you've got a, a situation where uh, you're looking at some dynamics in the marketplace, but we've got to bring together a lot of different types of technologies and solutions to solve these problems. And I know, Darren, one of the things that you're looking at from your standpoint and the space that you're operating in is this battle between the IRC, ANSI, RVIA, and again, maybe for, as we're getting closer to doing the zoning and planning, you can do your onion model to explain the differences between that. Because I think when the audience fully understands the battle that's underway underneath the radar, I mean, there, are, there are some very serious people in the industry that are trying to push and develop new codes in this area. And I think you know one of the pioneers who's sitting in our midst Darren has been trying to fight this fight for many, many years, and there's other people now joining in the battle. Okay. Uh, before, you, before you do that, can you, can you address that real quick? Yeah, for the onion. You want me to do the onion? Yeah. Okay, so if, if you imagine, um, this, if we're unique, uh, us playing homes, champion homes, other uh, factory built housing out there, could build a different codes. We're different than a site built, uh, uh, you know, site built company. So we have to deal with the two sides of the equation, which is coding and zoning. Coding is the build that we do, and zoning is the place that we put it. And if you think of it as an onion cut in half, there's different layers to it. So uh, coding has several different layers. It's federal codes, the international residential code. You can drill all the way down to the uh, building uh, to an RV code. So when we're talking about an RV park like that with one tap, a commercial tap, that's great, but if you're building an RV park, you have to have RV coded units in there, and then we're back to the same uh, the same zoning issues and regulatory issues that that's supposed to be recreational housing, not full-time housing. So the onion is, is the coding and zoning have to match on all the way down to the individual their particular lot that you put a house on, for, for us at least, for manufactured housing. 
seconds. That was good. Question. Mr. Mayor. Thank Hello. Thank you. I'm, I'm, Senator, I'm Senator Merrifield. Mike Merrifield is. I, the discussion has been fascinating, but my concern is is it really big enough to solve the huge problem? I'm curious, are we going to, will there be some discussion or can there be some discussion about multiple, multi family housing? Yes. Because it seems to me yeah. if we're yeah. going to make any progress, we have to take a bigger bite than the, the, the individual tiny home. Yeah, we're, we're looking at the first phase of this innovation piece and then the second, third, and fourth panels, we're going to start okay. diving into some more of that. Because again, multifamily housing has its own barriers and challenges that a, a lot of the industry have been, been balanced with. Uh, so I, I think that's a good point, but you might get that question answered in probably the second or third panel. Any other questions? Okay. Corrine? Okay. conversation I had with, with Todd actually we were talking about a real estate flip in terms of ADUs and, and Todd you can talk to me about this way he said hey him and his wife still exist in the big house but his son needs a place to live while he's going through college and doing his you know spending up a new job or profession so hey why don't you go ahead and occupy the ADU in our backyard we'll give it to you at a reduced rate you know son goes to college gets a girlfriend, gets married, starts to have kids, guess what? He's actually going to need the front house, and then Todd might move in the back and rent it out to his son and, and his new daughter-in-law. That's real estate flipping that benefits the users. Now, in most municipalities today, you can only have one ADU. They don't let you have two. Sometimes you can't connect them together because of codes and zoning. So the issue is that if we start to break away and chip away some of these issues about quality building technologies to add structures on a property and be able to extend utilities to them and lower the cost factor. I, you're going to see an amazing innovation take off. But how fast would it be that if you can go on the internet, purchase a tiny house on wheels, take apart your, your fence and drive it in, that the amount of time it's going to take you to get that accessory dwelling unit up and running and operating is far less. So the idea is that and what you're creating is a marketplace of builders and suppliers that far exceed what you can deliver locally. How many, you know, there's a lot of really good construction people locally that are dying to get in this business called DIY. But you know what? It's a nightmare because everybody that's doing DIY tiny houses are not building them to codes. So there's got to be some kind of a code process so when you buy a tiny house on wheels, it's going to be the right codes to put it in for an EDU. But it's an experimental space that municipalities and the home construct or the home building communities can start to work together. And so this is what I thought was a really good jump point in terms of, hey, we're not going to move rapidly with tiny houses everywhere and all you're going to see all these cluster communities. It's going to take time and be gradually built into over you know, a longer period of trials and municipal you know, wins that a lot of these communities are doing. But I'll tell you, you know, Rock Ridge, Florida, Ojai, You've got Austin, you've got, uh, there's some stuff going on in Salt Lake, I mean, down in California. There is a lot of communities now pulling this out and starting to say, yeah, let's let's tear out the, the zoning and codes and let's try some things. And I think that's what this community needs, is hey, to Mike, try trying things. Can, yes. can I speak to that really bad? So Colorado Springs, and this is a plea for everybody here, uh, Colorado Springs is really positioned uniquely in the nation right now, specifically for tiny houses, not just tiny houses on wheels, but communities and things like that. There are two of the three largest tiny house builders in the nation based out of Colorado Springs, us and Tumbleweed. Uh, we can build to a housing code, Tumbleweed builds to an RBIA code, uh, Sprout is based out of Walsenburg. Uh, we started the tiny house jamboree here, which is the, uh, the it is the known movement uh, thought leader uh, position in the nation right now. So if Colorado Springs gets behind this movement, we can position the city as the thought leader in, in a 
attainable housing and sustainable housing. Go ahead, Jen. Speaking to the point that of timing, Colorado Springs plans. Right now, Colorado Springs is inviting the entire community to be involved in the 2030, the 30-year plan of how we're going to grow. Um, some of the issues that have to be remembered when we're doing this 2030 year plan. Um, everybody talks about homelessness, but I don't know how many people realize it spikes against the 20 year business cycle. Um, we just came out of a recession. There will be another recession. Hopefully not a recession, but it's normal to our economy and homelessness and inability to um, have your own home, going back to your parents, or your parents coming to live with you, or your cousins, or couch surfing, or all these variations, will be back. And so, with the unique ability of Colorado Springs to plan for that, and plan for neighborhoods, whether they're co cohabiting, co-housing, boarding houses, apartment complex, and how we do our transportation, that's going to be part of that unique chance that we have. And, right and, there's a, and there's a lot of, that's a great point, there's a lot of fusion going on around the country. Detroit is experimenting with getting its homeless populations into tiny house clusters. Absolutely happening right now. This uh, Olympic, or Coyote Village in Olympia, Washington, has been a uh, kind of a poster child in a cost-effective model in doing this in the market being able to show how you can actually integrate these types of services. They've got incredible financials that actually lead uh, kind of a, a, a scalable model to start building small and then growing it over time. I, I'll kind of go through this fairly quickly. If some of you are interested in the slides, we can send that to you by email. But the, the key here is that if, if, when you start looking at the cost comparison between what it would take to put somebody in a hospital bed versus let's get them into a tiny house or get them into you know, housing first, We've got to come up with some alternative, low-cost ways of scaling through emergency, transitional, and long-term. And here's a, a, some very serious examples of communities that have taken on micro-housing. Doesn't have to be tiny houses; they can be on foundations. But they wrap their idea around a community, and they're managing it internally to get the value and get the sustainability. And there's there you can do internet searches. There's probably 50 communities around the United States that are actively pursuing. Tiny, tiny house cluster communities with homeless. And again, these are just some examples. And you're going to hear a little bit from David Rush from Walsenburg in our next panel, who's absolutely led the way. Uh, uh, Rod Stombaugh from Sprout Tiny Homes in Lahunta went down and purchased a high school football field in Walsenburg, and they're going to build 28 tiny houses on it. And the man in this room, David Rush, helped make that happen over two years to get their codes in to make this a, a reality. Uh, that's that facility will be coming up online probably later this year. And again, doing the same thing in Salida. This is a community with 200 tiny houses right along the Arkansas River. So it is possible to move the city, the zoning, the coding, the ordinances if you take a long view and you do it in scalable steps. And we're not, you know, we're not trying to, you know, make a, a hundred degree turn and have the, the semi tip over. We want to, you know knock this out with pirates and commercial demos if we can. Uh, and again, uh, veteran village developments, if we were looking at Tammy and I for our uh, veteran support solutions, uh, and then you know, what a checklist might be for making that happen. Okay, so any last questions in this area of innovative housing? I know that was a lot to chew on in the last 50 to, to 60 minutes. Any questions? And again, you can fill out the, the, the report. I think I have one for this session that you gave me, Cindy. Is that the Maybe we do that at the end. Yeah, we do that one at the end. I did have one question from Walter Miranda. Walter, are you here by any chance? There he is. Great question. He said, uh, for panel one, is affordable defined at a price per square foot with all necessary amenities included? So each individual or large family feels they are treated as fairly as the last person. So Darren, when you build a tiny house, can you build it on a price per square foot with all the necessary amenities included? Yeah, but if you look at price per square foot on a tiny house that's $50,000, that's 200 square feet, then the price per square foot really goes up. The smaller you build, price per square foot, right. 
really looks high. That's right. And that's why Colorado Springs has so many McMansions, because we have uh, an abundance of space, and it's easy to build an additional 5,000 square foot you know, on a 20,000 square foot house. Well, and, and Mr. Merrifield's question about multifamily, obviously, a lot of people do not take on multifamily housing developments unless they reach a certain number, 40, 50, 60 units, but now you're in the north of $10 million to build those facilities, and you've got to bring a lot of capital together to make that happen. What if we had the ability to start lowering the per square foot price of tiny houses through automation, through innovation, and through modularity? We can start bringing the cost down and creating the value and the quality and start getting more of them built getting them in place in clusters. So we could get 40 to 60 to 80 homeless people in a number of $5,000 tiny houses if they were designed specifically to suit that, and you did not have to have all of the facilities of living, doing your uh, laundry or showers and so forth. You might have a shared facility for that, but that's only an emergency. When you move to transition, you would have a family-oriented tiny house for the reasonable price point. Might be south of 25000 and there are people that are looking at trying to do that. So we just wanted in this first panel to really give you kind of a broad spectrum of what's going on in the market. Any last words from our panel members? We'll start with Jennifer back from this way. Well, I'm gonna answer off of the affordability. Um, affordability is based on what you're earning on your income. So back to the economics of the Colorado Springs, Pikes Peak region. If we're bringing in call centers that pay minimum wage, affordability is going to be at one level. If we're bringing in income at other levels, that's going to be a different affordability. Affordability is a sliding scale, and we need to be looking as a region, back to that 20, 30 year plan, um, what is the mobile income? Not the average, not the median, the mobile frequency income that we are bringing in, and that's where we need to look at what type of housing and how much of each housing. Very good, John. Paul, any last words you want to provide? Good. good. Darren? I don't think so, except just to reiterate that Colorado Springs is uniquely positioned to do this, so any help that, uh, that we can get, that the Tiny Home Industry Association that we're helping uh, kind of launch can get, the better for us. And there are some people in town that don't you know, think it might have a, a place to play, but I think they're, the tide is starting to, to change. Chuck, any words of wisdom? Well, I think that um, a tiny house, as long as it's got a hitch on it, wheels underneath it can be placed on the, in the, the, the flood lake. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, which is uh, no other house can be in the flood lake. And, and flood fringe as and well. Flood and, yeah, yeah, fringe and, and, and the flood lake. Um, the other thing you concern yourself with Kevin, I got one question for you. Do you think we could get Warren Buffett interested in some pilots here in Colorado Springs? 
Let's have that conversation later. Let's give a big hand for our panelists.